right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about attack on satellites, and it's a vulnerability waiting to be exploited. First of all, I want everyone to think about the last time they went to Woolies just to buy, let's say, bread or milk. Now, you probably expected your trip to be less than 10 minutes in total, right? So you go up to the cashier expecting to pay by FPOST and get the ordeal over and done with quite quickly. And then you find out that their FPOST machine isn't working. However, the cashier tells you that there is an ATM just around the corner. And to your convenience, you go to that ATM and attempt to withdraw cash, only to find out that the ATM is also out of order. How frustrating. So interestingly enough, these two basic functions, ATMs and FPOST machines, both rely on satellites and the associated capabilities that satellites bring. Uh, these satellites are often tens and hundreds of kilometers up into the sky, and we heavily rely on them to facilitate the day-to-day -day operation of our society. Things that we take for granted, such as internet connectivity and instant messaging, these things exist because of satellites. More importantly, the ADF requires space capabilities to ensure that we meet operational objectives and protect Australia's national interests. This is achieved through global positioning system and satellite communications, functions that are entirely dependent on satellites. Without them, it becomes almost impossible to manage the battle space. How would our nation's security cope without satellites? It's fair to say we would lose a lot more than just the ability to, bri to buy bread and milk with FPOS. Australia is vulnerable due to the nation's heavy reliance on space capability. It needs resilient and reliable platforms to deliver space power effects to meet military and civilian demand. This will fill the capability gap and compensate for the nation's weakness in the event of space warfare. Furthermore, the increasing threat to physical and cybersecurity of satellites needs to be accounted for. Australia must prepare to counter threats in these areas. Today, I will discuss Australia's weakness in the space domain, the Australian government's response to this weakness, potential threats to space assets, and solutions to fill the capability gap that I mentioned. So just a quote to reflect on. This was written by Jim Cantrell. He was one of the founding members of the American space launch company, SpaceX, and is now the CEO of Vector Space Systems. Essentially, he summarizes the economic, social, and implied military importance of space capability. So let's talk about Australia's dependency on space and the weakness that comes from this. We can look at this graphic here and we see with our Australian space market, approximately 50% of it is dedicated to direct to home TV and 30% is dedicated to satellite broadband and mobile communications. Now, if we, look at, if we look at what this space market is used for in defence, it's only 4%, meaning that we can actually extend our use of our current space market in terms of defence-related use. So, it shows that not enough is being used for military purposes, and we have very limited capability with our satellites. Also, this graphic shows our society's dependence on satellites and their capabilities. Without it, as I mentioned before, no satellites equals no ATMs, no, no uh, FPOS transactions. We won't have internet forecasts, weather, uh, sorry, internet access, weather forecasts, and stock market transactions. So this, this, this dependency has led to the formation in a gap in space capability. What have we done to compensate for this capability gap? So we've been relying on commercial and allied uh, satellite capability to fulfill and uh, to meet the demands of our civilian and military uh, people. So we've been using the Optus C1 satellite, a hybrid civilian slash military satellite that caters to both domains. And we've also had a heavy reliance on American satellite capability. And that also highlights, as Wing Commander Fredrickson said, the importance of our alliance with the Americans. So if we lose access to commercial or ad, uh, allied satellite capability, we lose our spatial awareness in Australia, highlighting this vulnerability. But why has this weakness existed? Put simply, budget restrictions. Australia's utilisation of space has been limited because of the allocated budget to, the Austral to Australia's space sector. This means that development of space platforms, until very recently, 
has been relatively slow. If we want to fix this weakness, we need to look at the architecture that supports our space capability, and that is cyberspace. So cybersecurity is, again, very important in maintaining our current space operations. It ensures that we protect the information that we collect and acquire and disseminate through our satellites. We can look at a weakness, our weakness in cybersecurity as a potential target for adversaries. So it's been highlighted that Western countries are now more susceptible to cyber attacks. Uh, the Defence White Paper records that in 2015, the Australian Signals Directorate recorded more than 1,200 uh, cybersecurity breaches in, th in that year alone. So that's highlighting that we are indeed vulnerable to such cyber attacks. We need to fortify Australia's cyber security so that the operations in space remain unhindered. It also ensures that the information collected and siphoned by our assets in space is protected and it ensures that it doesn't end up in the wrong hands. Now, let's look at why the ADF is so heavily reliant on space capability. Space capability provides a combination of, pers of perspective, persistence, and freedom of operation. It's actually one of the most important domains in, ad in addition to the traditional domains of land, air, and sea. And I couldn't help notice here as well, uh, in this little uh, thing here, we also have it mentioned alongside land, air, and sea with cyber as well. And I keep, I keep thinking to myself, I look at all the DFR and ADF uh, buses going around with, you know, uh, those pictures of land, sea and air, but now it's different. We need to consider space and cyber as well in terms of military operations. So in terms of the two assets I want to talk about that the ADF heavily relies on, I'm talking about uh, GPS and SATCOM, as they allow us to meet operational objectives with efficiency and reliability. So a global positioning system uh, allows us to effectively manage the battle space through positioning, timing, coordination, command and control of platforms that we use in the ADF, while SATCOM offers us a reliable and high-speed communications pathway. In order to emphasise the importance of these two assets, we can look at one specific platform uh, in the RAF, the P-8 Poseidon. So this platform, for its maritime surveillance purposes, uses SATCOM to fully extend its capability in terms of communication. And being an aircraft, it also requires GPS to uh, effectively and safely take off and land. So back on the ground, uh, the air traffic control can manage the airspace in which this platform operates. So you can see here that without GPS and SATCOM, platforms cannot operate efficiently or to near required operational standards without these benefits of satellites, such as GPS and SATCOM. Thus, it is critically important that we protect and sustain access to space so that the ADF can continue to meet its operational objectives. Furthermore, we can look at the Defence White Paper, which further highlights the importance of space through Australia's strategic context. So this is straight from the Defence White Paper, and it talks about uh, our local region, uh, and I'm going to talk about Southeast Asia. So we've all heard about the uh, brewing of conflicts within this region, especially with the Spratly Islands and uh, South China Sea, because of the overlap of exclusive economic zones and the ensuing conflicts between local nations. So in order to maintain uh, security and meet the ADF's peace objectives within, within this area, space capabilities will allow us to meet those objectives and efficiently maintain security. Uh, we can also look at the increasing threat of terrorism and insurgency within this region, as highlighted by Officer Cadet Nicolas Sora uh, with the Battle of Marari. In terms of uh, providing capability and assistance, ISR and space capabilities will facilitate that. So the ADF will rely on satellites to maintain security in the regions uh, that are of interest to us in the future. So we've talked about Australia's vulnerability through space. What has the government actually done in response to this uh, vulnerability? So again, from the Defence White Paper, we have looked at uh, how the government is going to uh, go forward with a solution 
to fix our vulnerability. So the Australian government has recognised the importance of space power in an economic, social and military context and efforts are now being made to develop uh, means to generate this space power. So straight from the Defence White Paper we can see we want to improve our space power through associated analytical imagery and targeting support. We've also noted that the government has made a $200 billion investment over 10 years in ADF capability and there is a heavy emphasis on space power with this investment. We can also look at the uh, technological transformation that the whole ADF is undergoing right now uh, and we can look at specifically the Royal Australian Air Force with Plan Jericho and its transition into a fifth generation Air Force. We can also look at the way the Australian government has attempted to formalise the existence of a space sector within Australia, within Australia. So this year alone, in 2018, we commenced operations at the Australian Space Agency. And we're also very recently hearing words such as information and digital age and cyber infrastructure and cyberspace. These words highlight that the way we fight in the future is rapidly changing and we need to adapt to that. So these points emph uh, emphasise that there will be heavy use of space power, especially in future conflicts. In terms of a methodology uh, in which we should mould our solutions towards fixing this space capability gap, uh, the National Security and Science Technology, uh, National Security and Science Technology Centre has given us the preparedness, protection, prevention and incident response uh, methodology as a way of responding to incidents of national uh, security significance. Essentially, the call has been made by our government to fill the gap in space power that we currently have and all of us must answer it. Now that we have looked at the government's response to our weakness, let's take a look at potential threats to space assets. This will provide insight into what warfare in space may look like in the future. So, hypervelocity collisions are collisions that occur at very, very high speeds. And there are two types. We can look at intentional and unintentional. Obviously, intentional collisions would involve uh, things like anti-satellite technology, or ASAT. And this would usually include things like uh, missiles that are fired from the ground and have an extended range to target satellites that are currently orbiting. Uh, it's been noted though that only countries such as the US, China and Russia have developed this capability and its use would be highly controversial and even risky as uh, the collateral damage that can be sustained from an impact will potentially uh, damage the operator's own fleet of satellites. So its use is very risky and we probably won't see this uh, be used in the future anytime soon. However, another threat that we need to consider in terms of collisions are unintentional collisions, and that comes from space debris. Space debris uh, relentlessly contributes to the highly precarious situation all satellites are currently experiencing. So this graphic shows the exponential increase of the number of satellites in space right now. So as you can see, space is becoming a more and more crowded domain within with an increased frequency and increased chance for collisions to occur. These, these collisions will uh, pose a threat if we want to improve our space capability and send more satellites up. And because there is so much debris, it's even hard to find space to put up satellites right now. Another risk that we must manage are satellite to satellite collisions. So the main example I'm gonna use here is from 2009, where we have the Russian satellite Cosmos 2251 that was uh, decommissioned at the time and commercial satellite Iridium 33. So because Russia had no control over the uh, movement of their satellite, it collided with this American satellite. Now if the US government wants to take that as an attack on their nation, they could, but Russia technically had no control. So are they really responsible for that collision? And to further add to this, we can look at um, the grey area of international space law, as historically it's only been really regulated by a few international space treaties, until very recently, where 
we have the drafting of the Woomera Manual by our very own professor here at UNSW Canberra, uh, Professor Rob McLaughlin. So this manual looks to be the definitive document on military and security law in the space domain. So basically through this manual we will look to regulate international activity in space and hopefully use it uh, for the greater good of mankind and potentially know what to do with incidents like this should they happen in the future. However, even these new laws will not eradicate the threat of collisions completely. Hypervelocity collisions are an everlasting threat, whether from space debris or anti-satellite technology. It cannot be ignored. However, significant development in international space law, such as what I mentioned with the uh, Wumera Manual, will look to regulate this international uh, activity in space. So we've looked at the threats to satellites that are currently in space. Now let's look at some of the threats that we can encounter on the ground. So satellites are not operated only in space. They need ground stations to be effectively uh, operated and maintained. Uh, usually you have a group of pilots who command and control the operation of satellites that can be worth millions of dollars. And adversaries will look at these ground stations as points of attack. Uh, in order to destabilise a country's security. So, if we look at... Oops, if we look at Australia's uh, ground stations, these are the non-government ones. And then on the left here, we have the related capabilities, such as launch facilities and telescopes. We can see that we have a lot of these facilities and a lot of ground stations that we utilise uh, for our space operations. Usually, the location of such ground segments are not known. So we can look at American imagery company Digital Globe. They do, not dis they do not publicly disclose the location of their ground segments because their main customer is the US government and subsequently the US armed forces. So if adversaries were to know of their ground locations, that would potentially put uh, losing all of their information, all of their sensitive information at risk of loss to adversaries. Ground stations are, uh, are technically a priority target for adversaries. So we need to look to fortify and reinforce the physical and cyber security of these ground stations. Cyber security is also important in protecting the information that these ground stations collect from the uh, satellites and disseminate amongst uh, the customers that use that information. If we lose control of satellite operations, consequences would include, but are not limited to, inability to conduct ISR. Uh, it would compromise the military and civilian security uh, of our people, and we would lose the ability to communicate instantly and efficiently. These consequences demonstrate why Australia cannot afford to ignore its reliance on space and the existence of the space capability gap. So what can we actually do to fix our weakness and compensate for it. There's no one method that we can consider. It'll be a multitude of methods because this problem is so complex that we, like, there are so many factors involved to, uh, and really it's going to cost a lot of time, effort and money. These solutions will come under the methodology I mentioned before, the preparedness, protection, prevention and incident response methodology because they will facilitate our response towards the consequences of space warfare should they occur in the future. So just another quote from Air Commodore Osborne and Squadron Leader Jolly in their paper, The Australian, Warf uh, Australian Response to Warfare in Space. So in terms of solutions that we can look at, the CubeSat, which is being developed right here at UNSW Canberra Space. And we can already see that we have uh, some prototypes here, one made by the Royal Australian Air Force and the other one made uh, by UNSW Canberra Space. So this CubeSat, a microsatellite that weighs less than 100 kilograms. In fact, the CubeSat weighs only eight kilograms. You can put this satellite worth 100, like millions of dollars into your backpack and it provides the same capability as a satellite that weighs 150 kilograms. 
So its small size is physically advantageous as it allows us to uh, have a cheaper payload, meaning that we can send more units of this into space and therefore get more coverage and more uh, capability out of it. So if we look at the capability that we want, even just 12 units of this CubeSat will allow 91% coverage of all the areas of interest within Australia, as you can see here. This is from a PowerPoint slide by Cartwright in 2013. It's also been hypothesized that we can use a CubeSat to remove orbital debris, and this would further vacate space for more satellites to come in, as well as reduce the risk of hypervelocity collisions. However, further testing of the CubeSat needs to occur, as we need to look at uh, the civilian demand for this technology in terms of data broadcasting, and we need to also look at the operation of the CubeSat in emergency conditions. So the CubeSat can be considered a viable solution, but we also need to look at training in terms of the ADF preparing for its worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario that I speak of is if we lose access to space. So in, uh, in response to this, the ADF has started training uh, in space, de uh, space degraded and space denied environments. And we're using systems such as high frequency radio systems and non-satellite dependent navigation and timing systems. This means that we can still meet operational objectives to some extent despite not having access to space. Our final solution looks at cybersecurity and education. So I think this picture was taken just, just outside in one of the little rooms down there um, next to the uh, HQ building. We're looking to improve our cybersecurity and the foundational knowledge that we have in the cyberspace domain. So this means that we need to fortify our physical and cybersecurity of not only ground stations, but of our supporting, ar supporting architecture of our space capabilities as well. In terms of education, we can look at the way that the ADF has um, started to improve foundational knowledge. So right here at ADFA, we can look at the introduction of a new degree, computing and cyber security degree, as well as a new uh, course for ADFA cadets, the introduction to cyber security course. So this shows that from the bottom up, the ADF is making efforts to improve its people's foundational knowledge and hopefully inspire innovative solutions for our cyber security challenges. Essentially, protecting the supporting infrastructure of satellites will allow continuous and unhindered space operations. In conclusion, we know that there is a gap in Australian space capability, and it's a vulnerability waiting to be exploited. However, our nation has already looked at the various, uh, various solutions that we can use to compensate for this weakness. Australia must continue to develop its develop Sorry, Australia must continue its development of its space sector to facilitate generation of space power in order to protect the interests of the Australian people from both a civilian and military perspective. And overall, developing our space capability will be hugely beneficial for the security of our people in the future. Thank you all for listening.